Hi there, it's Brian Sebastian, Movie Reviews and More, Worldwide TV Network, iTube 247 out of Franklin, Tennessee, and Women on TV.TV and iHeart radio platforms around the world. So this will be an interesting show because who are you and where are you coming from, Dr. Lomax? Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Lomax. I am from Columbus, Ohio. So talk about what you have going on. I've heard a bunch of great things about you, but I, sometimes I like to be surprised. Sometimes I'm like, oh, this is interesting, but I like to hear it from the horse's mouth. Yeah. So we've always got a lot of stuff going on. Um, in 2019, we, I became the first person to release 12 albums on one day, commemorating wow. the 400th year since the first 20 and odd Negroes were brought to North America as enslaved Africans. And since then, we've been really pushing out a lot of content to tell that story and continue the conversations, including a curriculum and a documentary, full-length documentary that uh, covers the premier concert and a lot of the ideas and philosophies that went into the creation of the music. When is that documentary done? Is it finished now? Or it's finished, yeah. We're, we're yes. hoping to release it this summer. We're going to uh, share a snippet of it with some friends of ours at um, the Metropolitan Museum of New York on May 21st. And uh, we'll have a soft rollout from there. And there'll be a local premiere in August. And it'll be available on Vimeo uh, May 21st. So it is movie reviews and more. So when can I get a link of this? Oh, I can give you a link now. <laughs> I'll, I'll, it I'll take it because I'm, I'm pushing five documentaries right now for three different film festivals. Oh, wow. OK. So four out of the five are good. The other one is just so so they just have to work on the sound and then you know at that point it'll be okay but got you they they want because they're my friends so you know i'm used to picking films um for film festivals and it's interesting because they don't know and, and it won't cost you anything when i submit it because i'll give you a free waiver code uh, thank you good thing about that but it's one of those things where i'm used to and then the team that we have for hollywood film festival and you're in ohio you said right mm -hmm. so beloit wisconsin is the mini sun sundance uh, it's run by the executive director, Greg Gerard, um, and he was on our team of picking films, great films around the world. They get a lot of great film fest, uh, films for their festival, whether it's Chicago, Ohio, Michigan, all of that. But a lot of them came from outside the U.S., and they were just great films. They were getting better films than what we would get for the Hollywood Film Festival. Oh, wow. Amazing. So uh, we're going back there next year. So I was helping him promote his film, his, uh, his festival this year. And this is... Is it the 16th year? I think it's the 16th year that they had it. They always do it the week before the Oscars when it's in February and the weekend of the Oscars. And mm -hmm. it's very successful. Uh, so it's been profitable the last 15 out of 16 years. The first year was the only one. So they've done during the summer, they've done their big, huge blow up drive in stuff. So when COVID hit, they had already been doing this stuff. And then I helped yeah. play Greek Film Festival in Los Angeles. That's getting ready to happen within the next three weeks. So this was so successful from us pushing it, they extended it five days. So the tagline was calling all Greeks around the world. And then yeah. Southern Women in Film and Television out of Franklin, out of, out of Nashville, Tennessee. So I like the women down there. We have 4 million views down there a day in County, just in Tennessee. So it's wow. those things where I don't like to help a lot of film festivals, but the things that I do put our name on, they've become successful. So I'm, I'm curious about this, what you, what you have, because it sounds interesting. Talk a little bit more about that because I love the fact that you already get it get it into a museum. That's really really good. Those are really really important, especially when things start to open back up again. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, we we started the project uh, back in 2016 when I started composing, and I worked with two local filmmakers that work with our local PBS station, and um, you know, they just filmed as much as they could. Uh, and the film really focuses on the camaraderie of my working quartet, uh, saxophonist Edwin Bayard, pianist Dr. William Minifield, and bassist Dean Hewlett. We've been working together for uh, about 21 years now. And um, the, the premiere concert was a synthesis of the full 12 album cycle. And they captured the whole concert and there are kind of uh, cutaways to interviews that I was doing leading up to the concert. Uh, rehearsal footage and uh, conversations between me and the guys and uh, me talking about the work. Um, because when you write something that massive, you know, you have to have some ideas that really keep the narrative 
uh, moving forward, right? And, and having some, some forward motion and energy. So the first third of the 12 album cycle deals with pre-colonial African history because uh, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture said, if we start our history with slavery, then it's very difficult for us to move beyond that great trauma and tragedy. So I wanted to start at a time where we were in, as, as Africans, we were in control of our own destiny. So pre-colonial African history takes us back to a time where we would wake up and make decisions and that's how we lived, right? There, there was no colonialism, there was no imperialism from Europe. And then we move from that time to what's called the Ma'afa. It's a Kiswahili word for great tragedy. That's 1619 to the present, right? And, and we deal with a lot in four albums. So we go from the, the, the first album in that section, which is a ballet set in a slave ship, to you know, the notion of American idealism, which often leaves people of color, African-Americans in particular, out of that notion of Americanness, right? And then we celebrate uh, four women who are archetypes for the strength that Black women have had to have to keep our culture and our people, you know, in this whole context of the Ma'afa. And then the last album of that section uh, deals with uh, the century cycle that August Wilson wrote that tells our story over the course of the 20th century. Uh, and then the final most important section is Afrofuturism. It's kind of palindromatic in the sense that the first section, um, Al-Kibilan, dealing with pre-colonial African history, addresses a time where Africans had their destiny in their own hands. And Afrofuturism expands that from Africa to the world. What is it like to be a human family that is all healthy, happy, and whole? Meaning that we have political, spiritual, social, cultural institutions that ensure that our humanity is the primary value, right? Not our net worth, not our material wealth, not our network, but the fact that we're human, you know? And so the final section is Afro-utopia, but it's expanded beyond the scope of Black lives. It, it's all of humanity. And so the film kind of traces those ideas and then goes back to the musical sections that um, connect to the ideas. I actually like that. That's very, very interesting. And I don't recall seeing anything like that at all either. Um, that's, that's very unique. Um, how did that really come about, would you say, though? Because that's a lot of work that you guys put into that. So that's not only the film, that's also the trio, too, huh? And everything that goes with it. Yeah, so, so the 12 albums are, are made by seven different ensembles. Um, there's uh, drum, there's African percussion, there's solo yeah. drum set, there's drum set and saxophone duo, there's a traditional quote unquote jazz trio with saxophone, bass and drums, there's a, a traditional string quartet, like classical string quartet and jazz quartet. I mean, there's all kind of stuff. And so in 2016, um, I was in a period of thinking that I wasn't being very creative because I had just started a job in philanthropy. And I was drinking from the proverbial fire hose, learning everything there was to learn about how this business works, uh, making grants, reading grant applications, um, understanding just the world of philanthropy. That's grueling. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's a lot of work. I didn't even bother to do that because I knew it was going to be so grueling. I understand that. <laughs> yeah, it's a ton of work. I mean, as an example, uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've read over 150 grant applications. Right, uh. so it's a lot of work, a lot of work. And, and so uh, in June of 2016, I finally got down to my studio after about three and a half months or so of just trying to figure out philanthropy. And I took a breath and I realized, I mean, literally every fiber of my being resonated with this number 400. And I realized that 2016 meant that we only had three years to figure out how to adequately and effectively and substantively commemorate the time where our ancestors set foot on this land, North America, and that they did that as enslaved people. They were forcibly brought here. And to celebrate the fact that we're still here, right? And to honor that our still being here means that there are still opportunities for us to become 
what we've always known that we should be, right? If you listen to the speeches of Malcolm X and Marcus Garvey and uh, Martin Luther King and Fannie Lou Hamer and all of these folks, you know, they're they're preaching and they're they're reinforcing the fact that not only are we human beings, but we deserve to be fully enfranchised. We deserve to be uh, seen as and treated as Americans because what the country has become is due in large part to the work that we've done. And so I wanted to figure out how to express that musically. And I thought I was gonna write just a symphony. Uh, and so I started sketching this symphony and I had the three macro movements, past, present, and future. And then as I, I continued to think it through, I realized that I was really outlining a 12 album cycle. And at that point, I got really, really scared. <laughs> you know, who's going to, who, how do you do this? How do you finance it? How do you figure it out? And honestly, um, it, it was a, 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 as much a spiritual thing as any, you know, I felt like the ancestors really came to me and said, this is the story that you have to tell. And I felt that way because I reached out to all kinds of people, all kinds of creatives in, in the country. And I said, what are you doing? 2019, 400, what are you doing? What are you writing? What are you composing? What are you doing? And everybody's like, Lomax, you're crazy, right? <laughs> we're not even thinking about that. We're just trying to produce what we're producing right now. And so, you know, after speaking to as many folks as I had access to and realizing that it wasn't really on the radar, it really did feel like it was a story that was mine to tell for, for the benefit of all of us, like not just black America, but the world. And so I started composing and I started to figure it out. You know, you look at how much it's gonna cost. The, the blue sky budget was over $400,000 and I didn't have $400 in my business account at that time <laughs> because I wasn't being really active. Um, and so, I started to use the, the income I had from the new job at philanthropy to purchase equipment. So the 4th of July sales, I caught them. The, uh, <laughs> the um, you know, Thanksgiving sales, I caught them. The Christmas sales, I caught them. And I bought enough equipment to record my ensemble. And so all the while I'm composing material and I had the benefit of some residencies at Denison University and the Wexner Center that allowed me to record all of the material. And, and what ended up happening is I learned how to be a recording engineer, a film editor, um, a, a, a mastering a audio engineer, all of those things in the space of about 18 months. And uh, in the summer of 2019, thanks to a Wexner Center uh, of the Arts residency, I had the resources to finish the project. I had recorded half of it on my own. Uh, but I wasn't the best engineer starting out. So some of those recordings weren't great. And so over the process of four days, we recorded seven and a half albums. And then I finished uh, the last album on December 28th, 2018. And we were able to release it all on January 23rd, 2019. And then we did the premiere performance, which is the capstone aspect of the documentary on January 26th, 2019. You know, the interesting thing about this, I always tell people, uh, and I know I know most of the best documentary directors, producers in the world, I've actually been in the rooms to interview them. And I would always tell people an average documentary takes seven years to do. That's an average. Mm -hmm. What you just described is what they don't know. Doing everything, what you, as you were talking about that, I was thinking of Spike Lee. I was thinking of uh, Michael Moore. I was, I, I this is what <laughs> this is what Ken Burns has gone through on his, mm -hmm. you know, whether it was for Civil War or the history of jazz. All those people, you know, even Barbara Koppel, I was thinking of as you were describing it. It's a lot of work. It's a ton of work. You do this during pandemic? No, you started it before that. That's, That's right. Even tougher. I guess yeah, so doing lockdown where you didn't, you know, we got the time in the world, you really can't go anywhere, you get forced to do it. But no, you did it before. That's a lot of work. Yeah, and so what's interesting is working with the crew on a documentary uh, focused on Logan Rollins, who is a uh, relative of Sonny Rollins. Uh, Logan recorded two albums while an inmate at the Ohio Penitentiary here in Columbus. And um, so we started, excuse me, capturing footage, you know, as far back as 2014, that ended up in this uh, final edit of the documentary, to your point about seven years, you know, we were on tour when the pandemic hit, 
and uh, that stopped everything. And so we took, you know, six months, eight months really from March to the fall of 2020 to really finish the documentary uh, because we had just hundreds of hours of footage, you know, and then what, you know, do you leave out? Because everything to me as the composer was important. And so I really benefited from, you know, our, my partners, uh, Charles Harrison and Jason Wood to, to say, no, you know, I think this helps the narrative arc you know, in a way that maybe that might be cool, but it doesn't really push the narrative along. So I learned, you know, a lot of stuff about film that I never would have known otherwise too. So yeah, it's, it was a ton of work. You know. and, and that's what people understand after a while. The second question I would always ask people, so what did you leave out? How many hours? And when you hear 14 hours, eight hours, <laughs> you're like thinking it's what you just said. It doesn't fit in the arc. That's right. There's always great stuff that's left out, but it doesn't enhance it or it doesn't fit and it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So that's why you always have that director's cut. Now you understand why there's a director's cut and why they have composers doing things. And Absolutely. You're that composer, that director, that writer, that performer of this is what, yeah, this is what, this is what a Ken Burns would use and why he goes through PBS. Um, uh, yesterday, I was supposed to have Lewendahl Smith on um, and so he, his, his, the last one that he, we were going to talk about Percy Julian, uh, the black scientist who created, you know, antibodies and mm -hmm. steroids and things like, hey, and what did he work? Was it in Ohio? Yeah, I think he worked, no, might've been Michigan, but it was one of those things like that where you, you end up shooting, doing, editing, rewriting. It, it, it is a lot of work. That's one reason why I decided not to be a filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> I'll watch it and I'll help promote because I saw what all the stuff that got went into doing it. And even when Ken Burns is doing it, he does five documentaries at the same time. Now he's got a daughter doing stuff. And yeah. the thing that he liked about PBS, and you mentioned that, is the reason he chose PBS, because PBS allowed him and still allows him to do whatever he wants and then he gets it done. He could never have done it anyplace else. Yeah. And you know, to your point, I thought just as an artist and composer that capturing the four days that we recorded all of that music was going to be the centerpiece of the story because I had never heard of that. I mean, it was a reckless pace, you know, <laughs> um, recording seven albums in, in seven and a half albums in four days was just insane. And, you know, that Friday I was back at work and I couldn't, my mind was mush. I was like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because we just did all of that, right? Monday through Thursday. And they were the ones, Charles and Jason, was, they were the ones that said, no, the centerpiece is this beautifully done concert that was the premiere of the whole thing. You know, I thought the story was the making of the whole 12 album. They were like, no, it's the premiere. And then we kind of, once we got the premiere as the central focus, everything else started to kind of fall in place naturally. And I learned so much about storytelling through the whole process from 2016 to 2019. I feel like I grew so much as an artist, just as it relates to telling stories through music and through film. Um, it was a really amazing time. Well, you just reminded me of Alan Hicks. Alan mm -hmm. did last year's documentary on Quincy Jones. He became mm -hmm. Quincy Jones's good friend. It was one of the things where they were doing a documentary on the first trumpet player, black trumpet player in the, in the Tonight Band. Uh, I can't remember his name, but, but the documentary was called Keep On Keeping On. That was oh yeah, um, that was, I, I played with him when I was a kid. Um, oh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, uh, but yeah. what you talked about, it'll come to you. But what mm -hmm. you talked about is they were going one way and all of a sudden this other kid comes in, Justin, who's blind yeah. and the documentary ends up turning another way. Um, yeah. Quincy found on, on, and on the trumpet player. So yes, those things like that. Clark Terry is the trumpet player. Yeah, yes, exactly. So you just reminded me of that because it was a great documentary that a lot of people didn't see, but then they started catching up with it and they love it. And I just mm -hmm. remember the interviews. I sat with, was me, my camera person, and I was, you're never allowed to bring a camera person into the one-on-ones. And I brought her in and she had just, was it Clark Terry? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and what, what it was, uh, she had just seen it the night before and it was only two other people. I'm like, why is there only four people for this great documentary, and it's Quincy Jones. Where yeah. are the other people that do the interviews? 
And it just blew my mind. And I had been waiting for this for four months. I knew it was coming and I didn't want to miss it. Wow. You know, I was doing TV and radio and I never forgot that. And Alan is on my list to call because I want to see what he's working on next. And I was bummed because I didn't know he was doing a follow-up on, on Q and mm. that last year. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, what happened? And I had his phone number. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I'm going to call him because I, these are the things why I want to do the interviews. I always want to get a jump up on those things because you get a chance to help promote it and it takes a while and you don't know what platform it's going to end on because it could change. Yeah. And the whole way of distribution has changed. You've got all these other platforms now, but that doesn't mean people can see it all. And for me, you know, and my fellow brethren and sisters, movie critics, we're not going back to the theaters. We're just yeah. going back yet. So I'm still watching everything on things. So now on my live Tuesday night shows, what I say, you can see like the Nevers on HBO Max. Well, not a lot of people have HBO Max. It's mm-hmm. On Hulu, the add-on is not the same thing as HBO Max streaming. How do I know this? Because I got right. sucked into paying to try to see Wonder Woman to watch these things. And my job is to uh-huh. promote that film and so that more people can see it because not everybody's going to the theaters and it's going to take a while. However, on a music, yeah. story, as you guys were talking about, you got lockdown when you're traveling. It's going to be the music business that starts to bring everybody back. So you're trying everything in. And I think that's a great thing. And also, when did you think you were going to do a documentary on this? Or was it always in the plans to do it that way? So I had a feeling, honestly. So, OK, let me say it like this. In 2016, I announced publicly that I was going to release 12 albums. <laughs> And as an artist in the Midwest, in in a small market like Columbus, Ohio, you know, that's one of those things that either can elevate your career or completely break your career. You know what I mean? When you make a bold assertion that way. And so because I had a relation with Jason, relationship with Jason and Charles, when they heard me say it, and I I was kind of teasing them about it earlier before I made the announcement, but when, when they realized I was serious, you know, they offered to just capture as much of it as possible. And we never knew what was gonna come of it because in 2016, I wasn't honestly sure that I could finish it, you know? So come January, 2019, and I really have this thing done, you know, and we set them up to um, capture the the performance on January 26, 2019. Um, In February of 2019, uh, Jason, text me he says I think we have a film (laughs) you know and so it wasn't honestly until after everything was released and kind of done that they started going back through the footage and 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 recognized that we had the stuff of a film that that made sense you know that could be good because like I said it was such a feverish pace I was just turning out pieces and we would record and we would perform and we would record and we would perform and I would write and then we would record and perform. And it was all logistics, trying to get people in town to record and you know, trying to get to folks. And, and, and it was just a nightmare on, on logistically trying to get everything done. But when we had some room to breathe, you know, we realized we had something. And so I went on the road touring the 400 uh, in August of 2019. Uh, and it took Jason and Charles really from February until from February, 2019 until April of 2020 to wade through all of the footage and kind of start marking things that they thought they wanted in the film. And so around March is when they started sending me clips of things like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? You know, is this kind of the thing? And, um, all along that time, I'm pushing them to, to focus on the recording session, that epic four day session. And, and, and they're like, okay, okay. And so they're sending me things like that and it just wasn't working. And like I said, they're the ones that really centered the concert that happened at the premiere. Um, because it was just, it was one of those days where, you know, everybody in the band played not just their best, but played like, they had never played before. You know what I mean? The yeah. audience was really, really responsive and really, really encouraging. And it was one of those magical nights. And they had seen us play so many times, they recognized it. They said, you know what? There was so much magic going on that day. We have to center that. 
And again, once we found that as the central focus of the film, everything fell into place. But it took a good 18 months to even center or, or, or understand that that was the focus of the film. You know. Okay, so now you just reminded me of Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace when she started. Yeah, that took decades. 1972. So here, <laughs> right. I don't know if you know the backstory about that. That was only released three years ago. Yeah, yeah. Not in 1972. But mm -hmm. and it was it was a Jonathan it was Alan Puka, uh, yep. who directed it, and it was one of those things where the music rights, all kinds of crazy things going on. You know, Rita wanted the one way, <laughs> and yeah. it makes sense. After a while, and then turns out the still till this day number one best selling gospel album ever. Ever, that's right. Is that they luckily they captured it, and then if you ever watch it, it's airing right now on Hulu, mm -hmm. and or um on uh, National Geographic, which is owned by Disney now, you get yeah. that, that eight-part series, or it's a nine-part series of Aretha, you know, genius. Cynthia Erivo. Good. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, you know, everything you talked about brought me back to interviews that I did on those things like that, and then talking to the real-life people who did that, who were there. Who were there. Yeah. That's interesting to me. And again, that's one reason why I tell people this is what I love about movie reviews some more. Just let me see the film. I'll know exactly what to do with it. Hopefully I'll be surprised. And I see it from beginning to end. I never do a 10 minute rule. And they can't mm -hmm. what that 10 minute rule is, is where a film festival watches something for 10 minutes and it doesn't capture it and they turn it off. I don't do that. I didn't matter how many films I had to watch. And I kept track ever since 1992. Till this day, I still handwrite every single movie and TV show that I see. And I oh, wow. What number I've seen, because in 1991, I watched a ton of movies and I couldn't tell you how many I watched. But I could tell you what the number was in 1992 on, because I have them still. In my wow. numbers. And have I, you published that? So it's one of those things where, again, I can't now I can't wait to see a documentary and I have to be pleasantly surprised because I have a feeling I know how it ends. And if it's the ending that I'm thinking about, that, that works. Yeah. How I described it. But again, you have to be pleasantly surprised and you have to give it a chance because yeah. it's a lot of work that went into doing it. And no one knows that better than you three. What did the other two think about all the stuff that went in? Were they prepared for all the stuff that they had to do? No, I, I don't think any of us were. I, you know, honestly, uh, Brian, I, when I said that I was going to do 12 albums, I, I was really thinking about the spectacle of the 12 albums as a means of drawing attention to the gravity of that date, 2019, you know, specifically August 25th or so, 2019, which is the date we, we uh, scholars think the white lion landed at Point Comfort, Virginia with those uh, 20 Angolans who were enslaved. Um, and I just feel like as an educator, we, we don't in America tell that story with the level of uh, gravitas and respect that it deserves. And so I thought the spectacle of 12 albums would elevate the conversation in, in a way that maybe hadn't before. And so, you know, they none of us knew how much work that was gonna be. Yeah. <laughs> you know, none of us knew the work that it was gonna be, but it was one of those things where, um, when, when we just started going through the footage, and we started to see this narrative kind of tell itself. The story told itself in a lot of ways, yeah. you know, um, and and it just made sense. It was an organic process, um, but there were as many hours of conversation probably as there were hours of footage. <laughs> you know. Well, what I mean? let me ask you this part. Uh -huh. Sorry to interrupt because I'm curious. Was as you were performing, where in your mind. You were still that filmmaker. What was going in your mind as you guys were performing? Because I, I understand that part when I'm doing a show. I've got 12 co-hosts, actually 13. They're all women. And my, uh -huh. my whole thing is five of them have their own brands now because of what we've put up. And the last thing I'm doing is trying to remember somebody's name. <laughs> and then what I'm doing is I could see how it's playing as I'm editing it later on in my head. So I have a feeling you were doing the same thing as you were playing, right? Well, the good thing is, honestly, Brian, we had developed a level of trust. So I trusted Charles and Jason yeah. to capture the footage that they could use to make the film in, in every case, right? 
but but to your point about thinking about the film as we're playing, I was just praying that none of the musicians messed up the music. <laughs> And, and that we didn't have, I mean, that we could really use the footage that we captured that night, yeah. you know. And, and honestly, there's one mistake. There's only one mistake in in the whole concert, and I don't. Well, people have bought the album, and nobody said I heard that mistake, so nobody can figure it out, which is great. But it's there, and it's on. And film. you don't tell them either. <laughs> I don't tell them at all. I don't tell him at all. Because I'm going to um, be looking to see if I know as that musician drummer that I am, I'm going to be looking for it now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and so when when I heard that mistake, I was like, oh my God, did we ruin the film? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but I, I'm so pleased with how everything came out. And, and, you know, there were a lot of sacrifices yeah. to, to get this done. Um, I was offered money that I didn't accept because I didn't want anybody to be able to tell me how to make this project and, and what to leave out. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, and, because that's what happens at a point. Hey, we will give you money if you put this in or you do it this way. That's right. I, you know, and Spike Lee will tell you that one. With oh yeah. There's an, you know, from Malcolm X. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. what I'm thinking about that point is so good for you. So you weren't, you weren't going to settle. And I've done the same thing too. You can pay me for all the stuff that I'm doing because we did it the hard way. It's That's right. hard work as you guys have experienced. Yeah, it, it was, but you know what? It, it's so gratifying now to be able to watch and share the film. And um, I've shared it with a couple of um, groups of students around the country as I gave a lecture or had an artist uh, talk about the work. And you know, to really see these young people you know, watch something on stage that I frame as a metaphor for how we can exist uh, as human beings in this country and around the world. I mean, when you think about connecting a traditional string quartet made up of predominantly European American musicians with an improvising quartet made up predominantly of African American musicians, and they're working together to create something beautiful, right? To me, that's what America was always supposed to be more than any other country, right? You know, barring all of what we know (laughs) had to go into making America, you know, once that nation state came to be and and we created this narrative about a nation of immigrants coming together to create something new. Well, I mean, a string quartet was created by Haydn, right? That's exactly, right? And what we know as jazz music came out of the experience of the spirituals and the blues that was created by the enslaved Africans. Mm -hmm. And so you bring these things together and and the music can't work unless the string quartet does its job and the jazz quartet does its job to create this new thing. You know, to me, that's what America should be and can be. And that's what makes me so excited about the work. You know, give you social media links. Pardon? Give you social media links. Oh, um, you can follow me on Instagram at Mark Lomax II. Um, and you, uh, Twitter is Drumversations and Facebook is also Drumversations. Give the title of the documentary again. The documentary is 400 and African Epic. And so you hoping the, by the end of the summer, hope maybe that'll be released? It'll be fully released. Yeah, we're, we're doing a soft release on Vimeo uh, May 21st. And then uh, we're hoping it'll be live on Amazon in August. Okay, good. All right. So with that, uh, as I, you know, Dr. Loma, so thank you so much for that. As that musician, I look forward to seeing this. But again, this is the first time I had someone talk about the documentary and all these movie, you know, experiences came up, real life ones on that. So something tells me this is going to be pretty good. So I look forward to seeing this now. And I have to leave with this. If you see someone without a smile, please give them one of yours because the world needs it. I'm Brian Sebastian, movie review some more. Dr. Lomax, thank you for coming on for this and we will see you next week.